Blessings, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the continuation of our study on the Gospel of John. Let's start with uh, opening prayer and invite the Lord into our time. And then we'll do a brief review of what we talked about last time on uh, Monday. And then we'll go into our study for today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to come together and to study your word. Lord, we invite you into this time, and we pray you will be glorified through the teaching of your word. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will illuminate the word, that we may understand it clearly. I also pray that you will prepare our hearts to receive it, not just as words on a page, but life-transforming truth that will change our lives completely as we continue to walk with the Father and the Son. Thank you, Lord. We love you. May your will be done. And we pray this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you'll remember, when we got together on Monday, we covered some very important truths regarding Jesus and regarding the fact that he was born into this world. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Also, when he was born into the world, verse 10 says, even though the world was made by him, the world knew him not. Now this led us into studying of a number of things, particularly the fact that the most critical piece regarding our salvation, above and beyond being born again of the Spirit and filled with the Spirit, is the fact that we know Jesus. We took a look at Matthew 7, and we saw people who were in the presence of the Lord, which meant this was probably the day of judgment, And they're showing him and telling him how they had prophesied in his name, how they had driven out demons, and how they did many other wonderful works. And we we knew in looking at that that this could not have been just people from the world Because how could someone who doesn't even care to know the Lord or to know his word be prophesying about him and driving out demons? These had to be church-going people. But this was the critical piece that we addressed. There are many church-going people today. In fact, I'll go so far as to say, by far, the majority of the church-going people today may have many things that they can point to that they did in his name. Maybe it includes working in the community. Maybe it includes working in the church. Maybe it includes giving financial gifts. But none of those things will ever save us. None of them. After these people showed Jesus what they had done, the reply that Jesus gave to them was away from me You workers of iniquity, I never knew you. 
It is not our good deeds, our works, keeping the law, religion of any kind, or denominationalism as well. None of those things have any bearing whatsoever as to whether you are saved or not. In fact, if that is all you have, you will not be saved. Jesus says very clearly in Matthew 7, as we had discussed, that the only way to have eternal life with him in heaven is by knowing him. It's by knowing him. Later in our study of the Gospel of John, when we get to it, which will be a while, we're going to talk about the vine and the branches. And we're going to see in the vine and the branches that Jesus says a number of critically important things. The first thing is, is that God will be glorified as we bear much fruit for his glory. That's what he wants to accomplish in and through our life. But how do we bear that fruit? Is what those first eight verses of John 15 will discuss. And all I want to say about it today is simply this. We are just the vessel for the fruit bearing. It is the work of God, the work of Christ, the work of Holy, the Holy Spirit in us and through us that bears the fruit for his glory. Our works in and of ourselves will not bear fruit. And the reason for that is everything we touch is tainted by sin. Though we may be born again, though we may be saved, Paul argues in John uh, in Romans chapter 7 that the things that he wants to do, he doesn't do. And the things that he doesn't want to do, those are the things that he does. We're still in the flesh. If we're born again, the Holy Spirit is transforming our life and transforming our life into the image of Jesus Christ. But the fact that we're still in the flesh means there's still going to be occasion for sin. And the only thing that is going to finally put that to rest is when we are six feet underground. The body has to die. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is on our heart and our spirit. So that when we receive our glorified body, we are a new creation altogether. The flesh will no longer drag us down. Now, if that's the reality, then we can understand why just the works of our hands will not glorify God. It must be his work through us. Which means we yield, we obey, and it is his life in us, not our own. That is what will bear much fruit. That is what will bring him glory. We'll cover much more detail on that when we get to it. 
but it's important. I know we've repeated this, but I don't think we can repeat it enough. Because of the fact that the majority of people in this world have a profession that they are a Christian. And yet the majority of them, by far, are going to hear those words in Matthew chapter 7. It's my heart's desire to continue to warn us now. While you have time to do something about it. Because if we are standing in the presence of Christ and those are the words we hear, it's too late. The fact that at the very end of that passage in verse 23, Jesus says, away from me, you workers of iniquity, tells us what the result will be of all the works of our flesh. And that is that we will spend eternity apart from him. Do you really want to roll the dice with something like that? At best, in this world, maybe we'll live a hundred years if the Lord were to bless us so. Average life expectancy is somewhere in the mid to upper 70s. So you're going to trade, or I'm going to trade, 77 years for eternity? Our finite minds cannot even comprehend eternity. But the Lord does. And that's why he warns us. This is what's at stake. So when Jesus says in verse 10, just to review, that when he was in the world, the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. The majority of the world does not and will not know him. And that includes those that say they're Christians. And in verse 11, we're also reminded that he came to his own. He came to God's chosen people, the Jews. He was the promised Messiah. He came to them and they received him not. The majority of the Jews in the days of Jesus never received eternal life in him. They rejected the grace and mercy of God and they will spend eternity apart from him even though they were his chosen people. Because it all comes down to what each of us individually do with the person of Jesus Christ. It's critically important to understand that. Just because the Jews were a chosen nation unto God does not mean they were all saved. As a matter of fact, the majority were not. And if that wasn't bad enough, because of the fact that they rejected their Lord and their Savior, God himself blinded their eyes from seeing the truth until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. 
We still haven't hit that time yet, although we're getting very close. When the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, the church age is over. And according to Scripture, according to Paul in Romans 10 and 11, the focus will switch back to national Israel. But ladies and gentlemen, for 2,000 years plus, the eyes of the Jews have been blinded because of their rejection of the mercy and grace of God. Chosen people or not, anyone who rejects the grace and mercy of God will spend eternity apart from him. And that includes us. This is nothing to play with. Also in the way of review, I want to make one more very important point that we spend some time on. And that is found in verses 12 and 13. Starting in verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. So who are the ones that receive grace? Who are the ones that spend eternal life with God in heaven and in the new Jerusalem? It's those who receive him. It's those who know Jesus. There is no mention in there anywhere of what you have to do to be saved because the work is already done. Now we are called to obedience and we are called to good deeds after we are saved because that is the fruit that we will bear for the glory of God. But those works are not a means to salvation. They never have been. Old Testament or New Testament. It's always been by grace. So those who receive him and know him will be given power to become sons and daughters of the living God. And they will be given the power to believe in him. But the second verse is even more important. And the reason why we mentioned this was so critically important is because there is people who believe that we are saved as a choice on our part. In other words, that we choose God. And we looked at passages such as Romans 1 and Romans 3 that talk about how we have rejected him and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for that of corruptible man. And how there is not one who is righteous. And that how there is none that seek after him. None. Which means unless the Lord divinely intervenes. There would not be a single human being in heaven. It's only through divine intervention. Which means it's all by God's initiative. It is not by man's. 
God draws man to Jesus. It's a work of God. It's not our work. Verse 13 specifically says, Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Who are the ones that are saved? The ones that the Lord himself has chosen. And before we say that's not fair, let me remind us, we don't want what's fair. Because what's fair, according to Romans 6.23, is that the wages of sin is death. Eternal death. Which means what we deserve for our sin and rebellion and disobedience is separation from the holy and righteous God for all eternity. That is justice. Now, who wants justice? Is there a single one of us that has never sinned or rebelled? Let me, let me remind you that that is the very reason why Christ came into the world in the first place. Or one of the reasons. For there is none who is righteous. And no sin can be undone. And God, being holy and righteous, can't just close his eyes to it as if it never happened, for it will compromise his holiness and righteousness. It's only through the atoning work of Christ, period. I want to add one thing to what we had said regarding this. When we looked at verse 13 and we see that it's which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, this would include thinking that due to our lineage or our national heritage that we will somehow be saved. An example would be the Jews, for example. For they were his chosen nation, right? When it comes to salvation, it's not a nation. It's not a whole religion. It's not a whole denomination. It's all done on an individual basis. Many, or the majority of the Jews, who were part of, of his chosen nation and chosen people rejected him and are spending eternity apart from him. And the same will be true for us. It's not by your bloodline. It's not by your national heritage. It's not because of your affiliation with a religion. It's not because of your affiliation with a church or a denomination, rather. Do you know Jesus personally? Is the only question that's going to be asked. And 
if the answer is no, then just like the people in Matthew 7 who have got a lifetime of good deeds, it won't be enough. And they're going to hear the exact same words. I never knew you. That's how serious this matter is. And don't let 77 to 100 years, which is what we would consider a full life here on earth, deceive you into thinking that that's all that it's going to be like in heaven or hell. Because no matter where we spend eternity, it is just that. It's eternity. It's eternity. Well, with that in mind, I want to take a look into the next portion of John 1 that we're going to be talking about today. We'll see how far we get. But we're going to pick up in verse 14, which is where we left off. And today, for sure, we're going to cover up to verse 18. And if we can get past that, great. But there's some important things that I want to remind us of within the verses of 14 to 18 even regarding our salvation and even regarding the work on the cross. So again, we can understand a little bit better the significance of the fact that Jesus became man. So if you have your Bibles with you, please open to John chapter 1 and let's take a look at verses 14 to 18. Starting in verse 14, it says, And the Word, there's that term again, which is what John started out with in chapter 1, verse 1. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. For he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received. And grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So the first thing that John is talking about here in verse 14 is that the Word, the eternal Jesus, was born into this world as a man. That is referred to as the Incarnation. John refers to him as the Word, with a capital W, because of the fact that, again, he and the Father and the Spirit 
are all eternal beings. They live outside of time. They have all always been, and they all always will be. That Jesus, that eternal being, the very agent by which all things were created, as well as the fact that he took part in many events that happened on earth before he was born into it. That Jesus, fully God, holy as God, became man. So by saying those first that first phrase, and the word was made flesh. It's like a little summary of what John has been saying from the very beginning. Jesus is not a created being. Some believe that. He is not a created being. By John calling him the word, capital W, he speaks of the fact that he is the eternal God. God the Father is spirit. God the Holy Spirit is obviously spirit. But God the Son is the only member of the Trinity that took the form of man. He was not a created being. He still is eternal. And he is still fully God. So, when he was made flesh and when he dwelt among us, John says we beheld his glory the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father. When he came to this world, he, only, he did not just have the attributes of man. When he came to the world, he was still fully God. He chose not to use his divine attributes. But he was still fully God and fully man. Now that may be something that we have a hard time grasping because, again, we cannot completely understand the infinite with the finite mind, and that's what we have for now. But there's coming a time where all will be revealed and we will understand it. But for now, the best that we can understand is that the eternal God in the person of Jesus Christ became incarnate, became one of us, and dwelt among us. And John says that those that were present beheld his glory knowing that he was not just a man. knowing that he was fully God and the full expression of God himself. That's what John is saying here. 
So going back to how man typically views the birth of Jesus Christ into this world. We identify with him in his humanness, right? Because we can understand that. But in identifying with him in his humanness, we cannot forget that he is also the eternal God incarnate, fully God and fully man, but never relying on his divine attributes when he lived in this world. For if he came to die for the sins of man, he had to become man. And he did. So while he had everything at his disposal to use however he wanted, he didn't rely on it. He lived life as man, yet without sin. Yet without sin. And this is what made him the perfect offering to a holy God. For how can sinful man, one of us, be an offering suitable to a holy and righteous God? When if we attempt to die for another, it's one sinner trying to atone for the life of another sinner. And in the eyes of a righteous God, that will, <coughs> excuse me, that will never suffice. It had to be a spotless lamb. Spotless and sinless. And that's who Jesus was and is. This is why he was the only one who could have atoned for the sin of He's the only one that was blameless. He's the only one that did not sin. And we're going to talk about that more today. So the Word was made flesh, the eternal became man. And part, part of the reason why he came was to live a righteous life without sin. That he may be the unblemished lamb that went to the cross to atone for the sin of all of us. Do you see how critically important it was that he lived a blameless life? That even in his flesh, he would not sin? And that's why I emphasize the fact that though he was fully God and had all his divine attributes, he did not use that. It had to be a man that atoned for the sin of man. And he did. And that's what the cross 
was all about. Now, when Jesus came, the life that he led was not just given to us in which to imitate that life, thereby living the same kind of holy and righteous life that Jesus lived. First of all, we will again find that that is completely impossible for us to do. We've never been able to do that. And while we are in this flesh, we never will. But he did. But we can't think that he came so as to show us how to live, that we may imitate that and thereby be accepted because of our own holiness and righteousness, because that will never happen. In order for that to happen, first of all, all the sin we've already committed would have to be gone. And we cannot undo one single sin. But secondly, we can also never sin from that point forward. That is not something a human being can do, even if they are born again. Because of our flesh, we still sin. And because of a compromised heart and mind, which is tainted by sin, we continue to choose, and to will to sin. It's not like it's something that just happens to us. We consciously choose to do it. We lust after it in our heart with desire to sin and rebel. How are we ever going to get a righteous life out of that? It cannot be done, which is why Jesus came. So he did not come for us to imitate, for that is impossible. But here's what he did come to do. And let me remind you of it from Romans chapter 2. If you have your Bible, hold your place in John 1. And please turn to Romans chapter 2. I'm sorry, not Romans. Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is what Paul says. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So who's living our life once we are born again and saved? Well, let me start with the fact that according to Paul and according to Luke, who, spoke, who wrote the very words of Christ, it's not us. Our life is not our life anymore. We have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. It is not us anymore. It's got nothing to do with us anymore. It's his life. So, in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, 
my self, my old man, my old life has been crucified to the cross of Christ. And we'll get into that more in a minute. Yet, nevertheless, I live, even though I've been crucified. And then he clarifies that. And he says, yet not I. It's not me who lives here. Christ lives in me. When we are born again and when we are filled with the Spirit, the very temple of God dwells within us. It is now his life for his glory. And the indwelling Holy Spirit and the Lord himself will accomplish their will and purpose in and through our life. We are now a vessel of the Lord's to be used according to his purpose for his glory. In Luke chapter 9, when Jesus talked, and Luke chapter 14, when Jesus talked about the cost of being a true disciple of his, he specifically lays out three things. The first is, you must deny yourself. Another way of putting it is you must deny the right to your own life. That's the starting point. Just like Paul is saying, your life is not your own anymore. If the Lord dwells in you, if your sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you are born again and filled with the Spirit, it is not your life. Your will does not matter. Your plans and your agenda do not matter. It's not your life. Your life was on the way to hell. And if you choose to reject, reject grace and mercy, that's exactly where we will be going. But once we are covered by the blood of Christ, once we are born again of the Spirit and filled with the Spirit, from that point forward, it's not our life. We deny ourselves. We deny our will, our agenda, our goals. It's his life. It's his life for his glory. That's the first step of being a true disciple. And that's what it's going to cost if you want eternal life with the Lord. It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you everything regarding your old life. Because that's not your life anymore. Your life is now in him, and he dwells in you. It's a new life. And the old life can have no part of the new life. So the first step is denying oneself and denying the right to your life. The second step is to take up your cross daily, meaning that we are willing to, to go to our death if called to do so. And thirdly, 
we follow Jesus. Now those two little words, follow him, means that we're no longer about our will, our purpose, our agenda, and the things we want to pursue. Because how can we follow him and do all those other things on top of it? Especially when the majority of those things are going to be in a completely different direction than the Lord wants to take your life. Following him means you abandon everything. And whatever he wants to do in your life and through your life, may his will be done. Can you see now that while the world may profess to be a Christian and to be saved, the majority are not. Because it's not by a profession of faith that we're saved. It's through the cross of Christ. It's his life for ours. His life dwells within us, which means our life is dead. We count our life for nothing, we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, and we follow. We don't tell Jesus where we're going, we follow. And our focus remains on him and him alone. That is what will bring glory to the Father. Going back to what John says in verse 14. When the word, the eternal God, was made flesh and dwelt among us, we beheld his glory. And this is the one who would atone for our sin himself. That is grace and mercy. Because as I mentioned before, justice would be that we get what we deserve. And what we deserve for just one sin, let alone a whole lifetime, is separation from him for all eternity. That would be justice. And if the Lord chose to exercise justice instead of grace and mercy, not one single human being would ever stand in the presence of God in heaven. Not a single one. So if you think that their cost is just too high, then you don't understand what it cost him. You don't understand the price that he paid to give you eternal life. He chose to willingly he was not under any obligation to do so. He chose to, motivated by love and motivated by the will of his Father, not his own will, the will of God. Now, if he laid down his life and he laid down his will, who are we to try to keep ours? when we're the ones that because of our sin caused the problem in the first place. You cannot 
serve two masters, John chapter 6 says, or Matthew chapter 6 says. You cannot serve two masters. You're going to hate one of them and you're going to love the other. So if you're going to try to follow the way of the Lord and to try to live your own life according to your own will, according to your own purposes, it'll never happen. You must choose who you will serve. But in choosing who you will serve, you are also choosing where you will spend eternity. Now, by the grace of God, since none would ever choose him in and of themselves. God divinely intervenes in the life of his elect. And he draws them. And like the Apostle Paul, before he was the Apostle Paul, who never had the heart's desire to find Christ and to be saved, it was God that divinely intervened in his life, knocked him off his horse, blinded him, and changed that man's heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh that he may choose to yield and obey Jesus from that point forward. That's how the Lord intervenes in our life. These are such foundational truths. But if we get them wrong, everything will be wrong including where we will spend eternity. So Jesus, just as a reminder, did not just come into this world to show us how to live that you and I may imitate his life. Because first of all, you can't. Again, how can someone dead in sin, imitate the life, the perfect life of Jesus Christ. We couldn't do that for a day, let alone a lifetime. It's not to imitate him. It is to die to self, to crucify our flesh, our life, to the cross of Calvary, that the life of Jesus Christ may live in us. Without that, there is no new life. Without that, there is no righteousness. And how can someone without any righteousness stand before a holy and perfect God who is completely righteous? It can't happen. It can't happen. Well, let's detour out of John for a minute because I would like to talk more about this righteous life. I want to talk more about what Jesus did in this incarnation during his three-year ministry especially 
and what this accomplished. Because many think that Jesus came in order to die for our sin. That our sin may be forgiven. And that's true. But that's not the only reason why he came. There's even a bigger piece that we often overlook. And I want us to see that today. Because our understanding of this will again transform our understanding of who Christ is and transform our walk and our life in Christ. Yes, he came to pay the price for our sin. But that's not all he came for. So please turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and I would like to look at verses 12 to 21 with you. And I want to spend some time here, probably the rest of our time today, talking about this. Because I want us to have a very clear picture of what the Incarnation was about. It wasn't for Jesus to just put on a show of how to live a perfect life. It wasn't certainly for us to try to imitate that because we can't. And it wasn't just for him to go to the cross and pay the price for our sins, that our sins may be forgiven. Because there is no other way by which our sins can be forgiven. The only other way, if it was not for the cross, would be for God, the holy God, the righteous God, to cover his eyes and pretend that we did not sin. Or, as some believe, that God will exercise one of his attributes, being holiness, I'm sorry, being his love, and that his love, they say, is his chief attribute. And his chief attribute of love would never send anybody to eternal death. So they believe that because of his love, that he gives us a pass. And he allows us to come into his presence. Yes, love is one of his attributes. But his love is not the reason why we can stand in his presence. The main attribute of the Lord that separates him from all of us and from all of his creation is his holiness and his righteousness. That's the one thing that sets him apart from everybody. So if we say his love overrides his holiness and his righteousness, then that means that God, in order to receive us by love, must deny his own holiness and his own righteousness. And he cannot do that. For if he were to do that, he would cease to be God. Do we understand that? We're not saved because of love. 
We are saved through the atoning work of Jesus Christ because what is more important than love is the fact that God is holy and righteous and his holiness and righteous standard must be upheld for if it is not upheld, he is no longer God. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, the holiness and the righteousness of God was upheld because his righteous judgment, which is to say the wages of sin is death, one sin, one violation, would lead to death. In order for us to be saved, Jesus had to pay that price. We have to understand this. He didn't come to just show us the way to live. He took upon himself the full wrath of God. He took upon himself the full judgment of God that we deserved. It's not holiness or it's not love that saves us. In order to uphold the holy and righteous standard of God the Father, Jesus never sinned. And the sinless lamb, the one who knew no sin, took upon himself the full wrath and full judgment of God for our sin, not his he had none. He took that wrath and judgment against sin on our behalf. That's what Jesus did. And that's why through the redemption of our souls, our lives are no longer our own. Because we have been bought by it with a price, the price of his life for ours. He who knew no sin became sin. And if that wasn't bad enough, he took upon himself God's wrath and judgment for all who are saved. And for those that are not saved, for those that are not born again, for those that are not his sons and daughters, they they will face the full wrath and the full judgment of God themselves. And if that's not bad enough, then they will spend eternity apart from him. Do you see why it is so critically important to get this right. Because if our doctrine is off, if our theology is off, or if we don't even know the Lord and we're just basing it on works or religion or a denomination, you can see how that will never be enough. Not to meet the righteous and holy standard of God. In order for us to be saved, 
someone had to die. And our death means nothing as an atonement for sin. Because that is just punishment and what we deserve for our sin. But the one who knew no sin took the wrath of God and the judgment of God upon himself as if he was the one that sinned. But he didn't. Now we can start to get a picture of what the big deal is about the Incarnation. Apart from that, we'd never be in the presence of the Lord. So before I read Romans 5 here, let me first share with you the fact that there are three imputations. Now, an imputation is something that is transferred from one person to another. And I'm only going to mention two of those imputations right now, and we'll cover the third one after we look at Romans 5. The first imputation is that the sin of Adam and Eve is imputed to all of mankind. That means before we even come into this world and commit our own sin by our own will, the sin and the sin nature of Adam and Eve has already been laid or imputed onto us. That's the first imputation. The second imputation is this. When Jesus went to the cross, God took the sin of all those who Jesus laid down his life for. And he put it on the shoulders of Christ. First imputation, he takes the sin of Adam and Eve and their sin nature and puts it on us. Second imputation is at the cross, God took the sin, past, present, and future, for every son and daughter of his, took it from the individual and put it on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. That is why he who knew no sin became sin, because he literally, literally bore our sin. And as he hung on the cross, the weight of our sin and the wrath and the judgment of God against our sin was poured out on Jesus Christ. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at Romans 5. Verses 12 to 21. Paul says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, 
even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man offense, one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That is, sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I would encourage you to look at this again if you have time. Because this shows us what the incarnation of Jesus Christ was for. It was not just to go to the cross, although he did. It was not to show us how to live, though he certainly demonstrated that. It was not just to cleanse us of our sin by washing it in the blood of Jesus Christ, though that is certainly what he did. There is one critically important thing that the Lord did. Which happens to be the third imputation. That many people have never been taught. So based on what we read in Romans 5, let me show you what that third imputation is. Let's take a look at verse 17 again of Romans 5. For if by one man's offense, which is Adam's offense, 
even though that was technically Eve who started that whole thing, God holds the man accountable for the woman, which is not a popular thing in today's culture, but that's the reality. After the whole ordeal regarding the fall, who's the first one that God called when he came to the garden? It wasn't Eve. He wanted to talk to Adam. So through Adam, one man, through Adam, through his offense, death reigned by one. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one which is Jesus Christ. Sin entered this world by one. But through his incarnation the very righteousness of Jesus Christ now enters into this world. As a matter of fact, it is not just brought in by one by which man can be saved and redeemed, But this is the third imputation. So here's the picture. First imputation, the sin of Adam and Eve imputes to all of mankind. That is why every man and woman is already born spiritually dead and separated from God. Second imputation is for those who rely on Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Their sin is imputed to the shoulders of Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin became sin because of us. That's the second imputation. But the third imputation is this. While Jesus lived in this world, he lived a sinless life. He lived a perfect life. He lived a perfectly righteous life, one that God could accept which is why Jesus is the only one who could possibly be the atonement for sin. For there is no other man or woman in this world that hasn't sinned. It's not just the fact that he went to the cross to die that his blood may wash our sin as white as snow. It is by the fact that when he lived in this world, he lived a holy and righteous life. Unlike anyone else in this world before him or after him. But he did not rely on his divine attributes to live that holy and righteous life. He did it out of obedience to his Father. Sin entered by man. 
And the only way that sin could be atoned for was through a righteous man. The problem was, and the problem remains, that there isn't one except for Jesus. So here's the third imputation. After our sin was imputed to the shoulders of Jesus Christ, and he died for that sin, now the very righteousness of Jesus is imputed back to man. It's not just that our sin and our sins have been washed by the blood of Christ. That's a good start. But you know what the problem is, ladies and gentlemen? If we only have forgiveness of sin and the washing and cleansing of our sin, you know what the problem still is? When we come before the holy God on the day of judgment, when we come into his presence, our sins may be washed, but we still have no righteousness of our own. Our sins may be cleansed. God forgets. He doesn't forget. He chooses not to remember our sin. There's a big difference. It's not that he's forgetful. He chooses not to hold them against us anymore. But with our sin covered, we are still left with the reality that since born-again believers, filled with the Holy Spirit, still sin, then you and I still don't have a righteous life, do we? We have no righteousness. We saw this in Romans 3. There is not one righteous, no, not one. So when we stand before God and we clearly see the righteous standard of God standing before us, and there we are with no righteousness of our own, how can we be in the presence of God? Here's how. Jesus comes up behind us. And he has us take off those filthy rags that are stained with sin. And he takes off his white robe of pure linen. And he wraps it around our shoulders. As an image of the very righteousness of Jesus Christ covering us. So now when God sees us, he sees that our sin is washed as white as snow. He sees that our guilt is completely removed. But now, as he looks at us, he sees the very righteousness of his own son, Jesus Christ. And because we are clothed in the very righteousness of Jesus Christ, we will hear the words, Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter.
It has nothing to do with our works. It has nothing to do with our religious affiliation. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ. And if we do not know him, as Matthew 7 says, then we will never be able to have our, wa our sins washed as white as snow. Nor will we have our guilt removed. And ultimately, we will never be clothed in his righteousness. And if we are never clothed in his righteousness, we will never be able to stand in the presence of God because we have no righteousness of our own. Three imputations. The third one is the one that is most overlooked. We're focused on the sin, as we should be. But we can't forget that God is holy and righteous and pure. And we have never been holy, righteous, and pure. Even being born again, we're still not holy and righteous and pure because we still sin. But Jesus, who came into this world as one of us, not only died for our sin as the perfect sacrifice, but he lived for our righteousness and he clothes us in it that we may stand before a holy and righteous God who will never, ever, ever deny his holiness and righteousness. That is what the Incarnation is all about. That is why the Word became flesh. In order for the Lord to have his sons and daughters, be with him for all eternity. It was not just a nice thing to do. It was a necessity. For we would never measure up. And the love of God, apart from the holiness and the righteousness of God, would completely change who God is. And that is why it is not exclusively by his love. A price had to be paid, and it was paid in full. When we get together again on Monday, I want to share one more dynamic of this whole imputation thing, especially the righteousness part. And I want to show you something in Scripture that will tie it all together and give us an understanding that we may have not had before. So after our review next week, we'll, we'll go into that, and then we will continue forward in verses 14 to 34. Thank you for joining us today. Let me close in a word of prayer. This will be posted both on Facebook and on YouTube. So please feel free to listen to it again if you need to pick up on some of these critical points. We need to know this. And every single bit of it, as you can see, 
is in black and white. This is not opinion. This is fact. And it's the standard by which we shall be judged. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. Lord, thank you for bringing those today that you wanted to hear this. And I pray for the others that will hear it later today. Lord, I pray that as they listen to your word, you will give them insight and understanding that they have never had before. And I pray, Lord, that you will draw each of us closer to you because of it. I pray that we will truly be salt and light as we reflect the very glory of Jesus Christ who became one of us for purposes far greater than just showing us how to live and even beyond taking our sin to the cross. But also to the point of living for our righteousness that we may spend eternity in the presence of the Lord. Only you, Lord, could have done this. So all glory and honor and praise goes to the Father and to the Son for making this possible. Thank you, Lord. May you be glorified in everything from this point forward, in the lives of each one who is listening to your word. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, everyone. I look forward to seeing you on Monday. God bless you. Have a great weekend.